Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Sanfilippo, editor of New Review of Film and Television Studies. Thank you for tuning in for our podcast episode featuring Maria Flood, senior lecturer in world cinema at the University of Liverpool and author of the new book, Moonlight, Screening Black Queer Youth, published as part of Rutledge's Cinema and Youth Culture Series. Dr. Flood is joined in conversation by Victor Evans, Assistant Professor of Communication at Seattle University, as well as a filmmaker and author whose documentaries and writing focus on LGBTQ images in media. Doctors Flood and Evans spoke via Zoom in June 2022, and their discussion touches on many of the rich aspects of Barry Jenkins' 2016 Academy Award-winning film. I hope you'll enjoy it and that you'll spread the word about this and all the other free content we've created and feature on our blog. Check us out at nrftsjournal.org and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Look for our handle, nrftsjournal. Now, without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Maria Flood and Victor Evans. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I have the pleasure today of being here with Dr. Maria Flood who just recently wrote a book entitled Moonlight, Screening Black Queer Youth. So, Maria, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Victor. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in film studies at the University of Liverpool in the UK. Um, and yeah, this book on Moonlight came out uh, last September. So it was a pandemic baby <laughs> book. <laughs> and I'm really excited by this opportunity to share it with audiences in the US. So, you know, we've got a, a little bit of coverage in the UK, but obviously it's really important to me to share my love of this film really with folks over there. Oh, that's great. Well, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Dr. Victor Evans. I'm an assistant professor at Seattle University. And I have to tell you, I'm so honored to be here because Moonlight is a film that really just spoke to me on so many levels. And again, my research area is LGBTQ images in the media. So this was so spectacular to read your book. I found it so fascinating. And there's so many things that you did such an in-depth analysis of that I'm still in awe of. So I'm so excited to be able to talk to you about some of these things. So, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, yes, you're very welcome. All right, well deserved for sure. So I kind of want to start by talking a little bit about just coming of age stories in general, because I know this book was part of a series that Ratledge was doing. And one of the things that I know the editor talked about in the beginning was about how sometimes films that are, you know, catered around teens and particularly coming of age stories tend to get overlooked and aren't as well respected as some of the adult narratives that come out. But obviously Moonlight, with it being a coming of age type story, did receive a lot of critical acclaim. And I'm just wondering if you had any idea on why you think out of some of the other things that sort of get overlooked and passed over because it's like, you know, it's, it's put in the teen genre, that Moonlight was able to circumvent that in some way. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, that's a great question. So it is Rut Rutledge's Cinema and Youth Culture series. It's just coming to an end. And actually, when I proposed this book to the editor, Yanis Kazumakis, he's also at the room, he was a little uncertain. And he did ask me, you know, how teen is Moonlight? Um, and I think it's a good question. It really takes us into the difference between films about childhood and adolescence versus films for children and for adolescents. And obviously when we talk about films about children versus for children, they're quite different categories often. Um, but it becomes a bit blurrier when it comes to uh, coming of age and adolescent dramas. And I think that's where the question of kind of audiences comes in. So where's that boundary between being a teen audience and being an adult audience? And what I found with Moonlight is that it really appeals to my students that I teach in university, so 18 to kind of 22 year olds. And I think that it still makes it a teen film, but it captures that element, I think, of nostalgia or a looking back 
that Moonlight invites because it doesn't end in the teen years. Thank God, because that would be really sad. <laughs> but, you know, because we're brought into the, the third part of the film, the adult part of the film, where there's a sense of reflection and looking back, I think it really appeals to that age category because, you know, they've just gone off to college. They're entering this third phase of their lives um, and they're looking back at, at Moonlight. Just to think about teen films and how they're overlooked, I suppose, I think there's maybe a perception about the simplicity of the themes or a kind of idea that these are uh, repetitive somehow, that you know what you're getting with these coming of age films um, and that, you know, maybe you choose it, but maybe you don't. But you kind of it's almost like a genre, but not quite a genre. And I, I think audiences sometimes think we know these stories and that they're, you know, for teens or for a particular type of person even who likes to indulge in that nostalgia, which I am that type of person. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I am as well, yes. And, and, and I guess that's why I've always kind of liked to be situated in that area. But it is interesting how so many of the ones, the films I've studied, or even the TV shows I've studied, which are teen don't tend to get very much critical acclaim. Like, I know I did this whole thing about with Buffy, the vampire slayer back in the day. Um, hopefully some people remember what that is. But yeah, it was like, it never won any awards. It never got any Emmys. It was never, or in terms of LGBTQ, what we're going to talk about again in Moonlight, it was like one of the first shows that integrated a LGBTQ character in an ensemble in a really genuine and unapologetic way. And I feel like it really didn't get, uh, I mean, I think later it got the praise that it deserved for it, but unfortunately it didn't because it fell into that teen genre. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I do, I, I think at least in film, TV maybe is a trickier category, but I think there is an explosion in interest actually. In, and this series is part of that. Um, and I think a key element of that reigniting of interest in coming of age film is because of more diverse storytellers. So films like Moonlight, you know, Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird, films that are really telling new kinds of coming of age stories. And I think there's something very special about telling the coming of age story with that kind of specificity. Um, and A24, actually, the studio that made Moonlight, uh, has produced a lot of these films. Another one I would name would be The Florida Project, which looks at child issues of child poverty, which I think is an incredibly important film as well. Um, and I'm hoping actually to start a new project on A24 to watch this space. Um, but it's it's really, it's brought out a lot of these um, kind of more diverse coming of age films. Awesome. No, that's great. I'll definitely be looking for that. That's awesome. Um, okay, so back to Moonlight. In terms of the timing of Moonlight, I know you talk a lot in the book about how it was really significant at the time that Moonlight came out. Between the presidencies, we, you talk about of Obama and Trump, and also when there was th this sort of, I don't want to say kind of like, because I mean, it wasn't like it was a ton, but there were a few films that featured particularly African-American themed characters that had been overlooked in the past, like Hidden Figures and a few others. So could you talk a little bit about the timing of the film and how you feel that led to like the perfect time for Moonlight to come out to make it so successful? Yeah, it really just um, kind of straddled these two eras that I think everybody felt the, the transition in that time period. So the, the film was first screened at Telluride Festival in September 2016, and it won the Oscar in February for Best Picture in February 2017. So you have, you know, a full six month gap there. But in that time, it just felt like so much had changed. And of course, it, it, it was hugely significant in the US, but I think we can say it was felt globally, really. Um, and I, I think Moonlight uh, couldn't have been made in a way without the Obama era or without the, the kind of uh, recognition for minority lives that that provided. And then it became, again, a kind of a, a very emotional film, I think, for liberals in America to look at in the wake of Trump's election. Um, 
So Jenkins himself, himself called it, Barry Jenkins, the director, called it a test of people's empathy at this time in America's history. I don't know what your thoughts are. It's, it's a really interesting idea of what a film could be or could do to act as a test of empathy. In many senses, it passed because I did a large survey, as you'll have gathered from the book, of the critical reception of the film. It started because when I first started to work on it, there was very little academic reception because it was just so recent. But then obviously, as the book continued, there was more and more articles um, and chapters to read. Um, but for the most part, yeah, mainstream criticism was really positive, including in right wing outlets um, and some Christian journals and magazines as well. Um, nobody felt kind of condemnatory and wholeheartedly condemnatory of the film. But that question of empathy was brought up in almost every newspaper review or article. So, yeah, that's kind of the political timeliness of it, I suppose. In terms of the cinematic kind of world it came into, it, it was really the Moonlight was kind of both overdue and long awaited for. You know, um, the, the first, I think it was the first film to win the Best Picture Oscar with LGBT themes. Barry Jenkins was only the third black director to be nominated for an Oscar. Um, Mahershala Ali was the first Muslim uh, actor to it. So it really um, kind of ticked. Well, not, I mean, it's not about box ticking, but it really felt like something that, uh, as the Los Angeles Times actually said, a film we've been waiting for. And so it was that feeling of, oh, at last, but also it was really of the moment. So as you mentioned, there was kind of this idea of a black film wave in 2015 and 2016. So Steve Rose, who is a critic in The Guardian, um, said black film is rising again. So what he means by this again is he's referring to black exploitation in the 70s and also the new black realism of the 90s, which we'll probably come on to talk about. But I suppose I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. You know, this idea of black film waves is itself kind of inherently problematic because it implies that there's just these moments of creativity. And is it really just moments of creativity or moments of mainstream, you know, white critical recognition? Um, and Ed Guerrero, the kind of expansive critic of Black American film, talks about how uh, these waves often come about when Hollywood is struggling because Black films are made cheaply. And 2015 was a bad year. <laughs> um, it was called the year of the Hollywood flop. So, yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, Richard, on, you know, these kind of, uh, this idea of waves and, you know, as if no films are produced unless kind of mainstream film critics declare them to be significant yeah. of whether yeah the wave has continued <laughs> <laughs> exactly um and yeah and you know what that, that's what i really found so fascinating about as you were talking about this black exploitation films in the 70s and then the black realism films of the 90s which had to do a lot with gang uh drugs uh, uh particularly in urban neighborhoods um and uh, you know my my thought always with that is you talked about it and I think you said it just right is that it's when Hollywood isn't doing well right when there's when they're not doing well and they need a quick way they think that they can make money because I because I sort of feel like at the end of the day you know it's a business right they're in it in order to make a profit and however they can do it and whoever they have to uh, exploit for lack of a better term <laughs> um, in order to to get the, that funding is what they will do. And I feel like we've seen that wave sort of happen. And I'm sort of curious what you think is that I sort of thought that, that there was this sort of wave when Moonlight came out, but then it sort of, I feel like stalled a little bit and I haven't seen it continue. And I don't know if that has to do with COVID or if there's some other things that have been at play, but I am kind of curious like, when is that? I mean, I hate the fact that we even have to talk about it as cycles, right? Because it should be something that should just be there all the time. But of course, that's not the reality. But like, where is this next wave where we're going to get this, you know, more 
content, particularly, you know, African-American content or black content, but what about uh, LGBTQ content or African-American LGBT content or black, you know what I mean? It's just like, we're still, I think, long overdue for those types of films. And Moonlight, I was hoping, was going to start this trend. And it really just sort of started it. It was loved and praised. And then I feel like that it just kind of like didn't necessarily end. I still it continued in some areas, but not within the mainstream. Yeah. And I think uh, Moonlight, I think you're exactly right. Um, Moonlight was or is not unique, but particular in that it really um, encompasses kind of both mainstream audiences but also certainly feeds into art house audiences as well and that's the type of content I think we're missing you know we have a kind of diverse representation in a lot of mainstream Hollywood films but they're not necessarily telling the stories of those communities they're, they're you know big budget franchises or um you know, kind of a, a lot of genre stuff, whereas Moonlight was, of course, grounded in, in, you know, the specifics of these lives. I mean, I do wonder, has a lot of this kind of content moved to TV? Problematic to a certain extent because TV doesn't always get the recognition that it probably deserves in terms of a kind of art form, although I think that's changing, um, you know, with the rise of the showrunner as auteur kind of figure. I think that is changing, but I think it is deeply problematic that actually these films aren't getting funded in Hollywood. And you could say there, there was a kind of backlash, I think, was it 2018 or 2019 when the all the Best Picture nominees, it was like the Joker, the Irishman, um, I think there was another, was it a Coen Brothers? Um, there was all white male directors. And then I think to go back again, you had Parasite, and then um, last year was Nomadland. But at the same time, now this could be the pandemic, but as you have, you know, these films made by more diverse filmmakers, you have the category of the Oscars and the validity of the Oscars being questioned altogether, you know? Are Oscars really a measure of value? Now, that's a good question. But are, why are you only asking it when diverse directors and artists are suddenly being rewarded? So, yeah, I think, I think it is... Uh, uh, an ongoing kind of issue. Oh, and I think you bring up such a good point about television, because I don't know about you, but in my research, television is just exploding in terms of diversity and inclusion on all areas, it seems. And to me, it's such a striking difference when you don't see that in the film industry as well. Like I could count, I mean, I could just run down the list of now of like, you know, queer people of color, you know, uh, characters on television shows. I mean, almost every show, you know, just about has some sort of, but then movies, you're hard pressed, you know, unless you're going to the indie or the art house films to even find a film that has, you know, an LGBTQ character, like you said, who's not just, you know, kind of, you know, thrown in as, you know, I don't want to say a token, but just kind of like an ancillary kind of like character, like you said, very much unlike Moonlight, which was very much grounded in telling that story. But instead, they're just there, but their stories aren't being told. And even that's hard to find. I think Glad just did a study. They do a, a, stu a studio responsibility index, which I'm sure you're aware of. And like, you know, even with the pandemic, there weren't as, there weren't as many films made, but still of the films made, like, you know, only a small percentage of them even had any type of LGBTQ representation at all, less long people of color, you know, LGBT people of color within it. And it's just such this dirt. And then here we're exploding on TV. I just find that to be such a dichotomy right now. Absolutely. Um, and it has been maybe for for a while. I've been watching Star Trek, the original series again, and it was lauded as this wonderfully diverse uh, show. Now, when you look at it, you're like, all oh, the main characters are middle aged white men, but like there's a Hura, you know, you know that was that was progressive for TV and film at that time. I think with TV, some of the reasons for it's it's much, as you say, clearly much greater engagement. 
um, with black and queer lives and diversity of all types. Is, is it traditionally kind of lower status? Now, obviously, this changed in the 90s with shows like The Sopranos, which integrated some of the aesthetics and techniques of cinema into TV. But yeah, that's traditionally how it's perceived. There's less gatekeeping. I think maybe it's less network, you know. I have no connections in Hollywood, but from what I read, it seems to be very much about connections and who's in the room when decisions are made and who you know. TV also maybe, for all these reasons, makes it more accessible to women and minorities. And I wonder, is there anything in the format of TV as well that lends itself better to, to better telling these stories, the, the kind of long, the long format? There's also what's called a Netflix effect. So basically with, with streaming services, there's a huge drive for content from all the streaming providers to greatly increased audiences. So you have people, you know, an explosion of watching, as we all know, you know, we're used to watch maybe two shows a night, it can grow to four or five, six. <laughs> There's more devices to watch things on and people are investing more time in watching TV. Um, so there's, there's just more money available and the, the kind of streaming services are willing to take more risks than the studios. Now, this is real short sightedness, I think, on the part of the studios, but they've always been short sighted. So when I did the research, I discovered that, um, I mean, this wasn't my original research, but in an article I read that African-American audiences are consist consistently watch. Um, more TV and film and audiovisual material than any other group, you know. So what are the studios are really missing a trick here? And then I think Asian Americans are second with white audiences last. Um, and even you know, if we think of like mainstream white straight audiences, I think you know more and more that they're not choosing to watch things based on the identity of the characters. You know, I think there's a lot more, uh, probably genre um, is a much higher factor in, in choosing a, a show to watch than something like that. So I think studios really haven't caught up with this um, and are really quite behind uh, and have quite a rigid idea of who their viewers are and what their viewers want. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and like you said, the streamers are taking risks and those risks are paying off. And you're right, Hollywood refuses to take risks. If anything, they go back to what's tried and true over and over and over again, rather than doing something original, new and different and innovative that could possibly garner new audience. Absolutely, and it's just astonishing to see that you have something like Moonlight, which did all that, um, and they don't seem to kind of learn the lessons from it. I mean, the thing is, you're not talking about the major books. So with a film like Moonlight, I think Moonlight cost 1.5 million to make and it made about 68 million. I don't have the figures for, you know, the big budget things, but I know like Kubrick's Spartacus, for example, in the 60s was like 300 billion, like so crazy number <laughs> made. Much more than Moonlight, you know, five years ago. So yeah, they're not making huge amounts of money, but what they are making is huge profit margins. So yeah, that's the the difference. And of course, if studios see that they can be made cheaply, you know, they might invest in them. But why should they continue to have to be made cheaply? Mm. So yeah. Yes. Well, you're definitely preaching to the choir here. So. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> mm. So um, back to Moonlight. I want to talk specifically about um, because what I really loved about your book is you talk a lot about the stereotypes within Moonlight but how those stereotypes were disrupted. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because there's so many different stereotypes within it, like drug dealers, bullies, addicts, black boys. I mean, all of these things. And what I really love about the film is that those characters are then, you're, you're familiar with them just enough uh, to kind of get an, uh, an idea of what you think these people are but then they surprise you or, or things are changed in a certain way that I just found fascinating. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, it, it, so critics were really divided, I think, on the role of stereotype within the film. And as you say, yeah, a lot of these stereotypes go back to 
stereotypes that also exist in, in films like New Black Realism and then are adopted in mainstream film as well. I mean, black exploitation started off as a, a really kind of radical and then the studios get involved and it becomes more and more stereotyped. And all these, yeah, all these pop up in Moonlight. I mean, why why does Jenkins evoke these stereotypes? One one argument might be that uh, I, I don't think it's funding necessarily, but that in making a film like this, it can be helpful or useful to have something that feels familiar to audiences. Um, so uh, some people seek out extremely experimental films. Many audiences like familiarity with surprise. So even something like Parasite is a really unusual film, but it, generically there are things that feel familiar when we watch it. So that combination of the familiar and the unexpected, which he does as well in terms of locations. So, you know, we're in the hood, inverted commas, it's gritty, inverted commas, which that term is so overused. But at the same time, he films it in a way that uh, at times twists that and makes it quite aesthetically stunning sometimes. So I think the whole film plays with this idea of familiarity and the unexpected. How does he disrupt these stereotypes? I think it's it's different ways for different characters, but I guess in terms of Chiron, and actually maybe Juan as well, is this play between the interior and the exterior that is one of the things that I love most about the film. I think it's so rare to get to spend so much time with such a, a, a such a special character, to, to be feel so intimate um, with a character like this and to have that personality carry over three stages of life. Um, and so even though the actors look quite different, Jenkins says he picked them because of their eyes and a particular look. And that really speaks to the significance he places on interiority. So a lot of the kind of new black realist films um, were really politically engaged and, and brilliant at the time, but they were quite didactic, you know, so they really show problems. Um, there's that line from Boys in the Hood where Joe Boy says, you know, they, they don't know or they don't show what's going on in the hood. And that's the lesson kind of of the film and Furious, the character in that played by um, Lawrence Fishburne, isn't it? You know, he gives these speeches and stuff and Moonlight doesn't do that, I think, because it couldn't do that and still maintain this focus on Chiron's interior life. And I think another way that he undoes these stereotypes is showing the full arc of a youthful life. <laughs> so it's not a full, like, you know, the, the tagline of the film says, this is the story of a lifetime, but it's not really. It's, you know, the first 30 years maybe. Um, but I think it's so important that the film begins in childhood and not just with a few scenes like we get in other films, but it, it might be the shortest section in the film, but certainly it has many of the most iconic moments. So the swimming scene, football scene and I think that's really important that it begins there because everything we see afterwards is colored by that um, and that's not just for Chiron I, I think that's for the character of Paula as well who is another stereotype and I think she's been more controversial in terms of the stereotyping than even Chiron but I think we have to well, one of the critics I can't remember their name but it's in um the edited collection by George Yancey. And they, they talk about how Paula actually, in a way, has the most uh, kind of uh, striking trajectory. You know, she goes from a nurse to an addict to, uh, to in recovery, which is a huge narrative arc, actually. So, you know, we follow that journey with her as well. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, that's one of the things that I think really drew me to the film is that these characters, we really get to see their transformations on so many different levels. And like you said, I think breaking it up the way that they, that, that the way that the narrative does, seeing these first, like you said, 30 years of a person's life so clearly and, and like internally and externally is just amazing. 
But you said one thing at the beginning of this that I kind of want to go back to is that the familiarity of stereotypes and how there is something about that that draws people in. And here we get back to this whole universality thing, right? About, and I know you talk a lot about that in the book as well. And, you know, I have pros and cons about this. So I would love to hear what your feelings are. Because, again, we hear this all the time when it comes to queer film or even, you know, black films, right? Oh, it's universal. It's universal, you know? And, yeah, you know, I, I and you make a great argument for this, so I'll let you talk about it. But, like, how it, that can be a positive, but that can also be a negative as well. Um, and it just brings me back to, like, Brokeback Mountain and how Ang Lee and everyone was like, oh, it's such a universal film. It's a story of love. And taking away from what it really is about. But anyway, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a really tricky question. I suppose that's the area in the book um, where I probably had the most uh, <laughs> heartache or, or thought over because I suppose there was a part of me that wanted Moonlight to be universal because as, you know, a white Irish woman, <laughs> I felt there was so much in Jairone's story that resonated personally with me, really all around the teenage stuff, um, teenage trials. And I, I wanted to kind of, I suppose, justify my connection to the film. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can't ignore the kind of emotional, political, social significance of the film to black and queer and black queer communities. That's just not, you know, so I, I really wanted to think about how we can hold both together. And I think that's what makes the film so incredibly special to me is that it does manage to hold both these things together. And Jenkins talks about that. He wants the film to be universal. But, you know, it's it's it, it has to also remain, I guess, uh, something that belongs particularly to, to those communities. And I think Jenkins is very careful as well. And he invites uh, he invites me and others who maybe don't have that because uh, he talks about how he's not he's not gay himself and how he really had to think deeply about telling this story and how he could tell this story. But he talked about how similar his childhood was to McCraney's. You know, they grew up in Liberty City at the same time. Both of their mothers uh, had addiction issues. And so that's the connection that he was able to feel. So I think I think the film, particularly in the areas of childhood, um, emotional tribulation, I mean, addiction was another area, like parental addiction was another area that I connected with the film. And I think we have to allow that to a certain extent you know and I I don't know why it's so difficult for us to hold two things together um but it seems to be and I suppose one of the reasons it's difficult is because as you said critics fall on the universal to the exclusion of the specific and we we can't do that we have to say well uh, because it's not I mean it appealed to me but it appealed to me as well for specific reasons and, you know, a wide audiences doesn't necessarily mean universal. I think the example of Brokeback is great because that's really the origin of a lot of this kind of thinking around universality in queer film. And I think we have to remember audiences in this as well and individuals. And, you know, I taught that film to students who were like, oh, yeah, you know, it erases the queer love story and all that. And then I played them an act from the podcast S-Town I don't know if you've listened to it but it's about this guy who grows up in a town he, a white guy he's uh, in his 50s he's kind of in the closet he grows up in a town in uh, Alabama and it, it, him and his friend talk about what Brokeback Mountain meant to them and the emotion in their voices like they bought one of them bought a projector just to watch the film they had to get a new DVD they'd watch it and the emotion in their voices, and when I play that to students, it takes the film away, I suppose, from some of the more intellectual side of thinking about universality and into the emotional aspects of how, you know, how much films can mean to individuals. So, yeah, I think it's really complicated, and I think we have to really not uh, not seek to undo the 
political, social, and uh, you know meanings of these films, while also acknowledging different emotional reactions to them as well. I don't know what you were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny as you were saying that about. I haven't seen S Town, but I mean, listening to it, but I'm definitely going to have to now because. I sort of had a similar experience with Moonlight when I was discussing it with people, with my neighbors. So I, I live on an island outside of Seattle that's very, very, very white. Um, it actually, it's probably one of the whitest areas of town when you look at demographics. But on the other hand, it's the most diverse in terms of LGBTQ. So it's a, it, it's a really interesting dynamic. But I was invited to a dinner party almost everyone there, mostly Caucasian. And we were talking about Moonlight. This was right when Moonlight got nominated and people were starting, it was really getting all of the buzz at that time. And I remember a couple came up to me, Caucasian couple, and they were like, you know, um, I just don't get it. You know, they were just like, I just didn't get the film. They were like, I, I wanted to like it. There was all this buzz about it. But, you know, to me, it just, I didn't know what I, you know, it was just, I, I just thought about drugs and a drug dealer and like this boy's life and what, and it really took me aback because again, as, as so many people, this was the film as a queer black person myself, you know, this is the film I had been waiting on. And I'm like, you're kidding me. Like, how could you not? And so I had to break it down personally and emotionally for me to explain what it was for me to see that on film and to see what basically what I, like you said, like it reson it so resonated. And again, I know I am that audience, but, but it was just such a resonation for me to be able to see what I went through and understand that, that those are the things that I, and when I explained it to them on that emotional level, just like you said, they were able to comprehend what the film was about. And sometimes I think that's such a great point is that sometimes it does take that emotional layer that some people just can't tap into just because they don't have that experience to really be able to understand the film. That's a really great point. And I think maybe there's people, you know, people, some people aren't used to using or using, um, I just did inverted commas, but uh, film or TV in that way as an emotional journey as an emotional outlet, as a way to explore pa the past, your past. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my dad was another example. There was so much in the film that reminded me of his childhood because he grew up extremely poor. And he watched it and he, he, couldn't, he couldn't really connect to it, you know. And I, it's very hard for him to tap into that childhood, uh, for sure. Um, but I had to accept that, you know, maybe an 80-year-old white man in Ireland this is just not something he's able um, to connect to. Although there was, yeah, there was just a lot in, in how that uh, growing up in that kind of uh, poverty uh, impacts someone that I thought resonated, but yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well, while we're on, I know, and this is, I know we could talk, do a whole podcast on this topic, but this is one that's so fascinating to me. And while we are talking about universality and about, you know, what kind of film Moonlight is, there's this whole debate about the queer film versus the LGBTQ film. And I have to tell you, I just did a grant, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a grant um, where I'm doing okay. a book on new queer cinema. And I, you know, I went through my Office of Sponsored Projects at my university, and I had the hardest time trying to explain to them the difference. And by the time we were all said and done and I wrote out the grant proposal, they were like, we still don't get it. You know, we still like we still don't get it. So I feel like this is such a crucial thing right now in this area of queer studies and film and and about what does constitute a queer film? What is an LGBTQ film? And is there a difference or are they synonymous? Yeah, I don't know that I can, <laughs> if you can't answer that. I mean, I thought this was such a fascinating area of the theory for me to look at, actually. Um, and I suppose it, 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 it can't really, I don't know, would you agree, but I don't think it can be separated from the kind of uh, gains in political gains, civil rights gains that we've seen over the last kind of 20 years, I guess, 
for the LGBT community. Uh, some of those are under threat, of course. Um, but I, I, the increasing visibility in film uh, of, uh, of LGBTQ film, which kind of moves it into the mainstream. But then there's also a loss, you know, there's the loss of maybe the kind of radical potential. And I think Moonlight really became a nexus for that debate because I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if it's an age thing necessarily or a politics thing, but for some people, you know, Moonlight was definitely a radical film um, and definitely, you know, within that category of queer cinema, whereas for others, and I see this perspective very clearly, it is what I called in the book LGBT themed, just to distinguish it. But, you know, you have, yeah, you do have that kind of, uh, the bullying, the in the closet, the coming of age story, a lot of the lack of sex, a lot of these tropes that were the beauty of the film as well, and um, which is also critiqued in Call Me by Your Name. I find it tricky though because audiences still, you know, love these films, and and audiences who love Moonlight and see it as radical think Call Me by Your Name is is the opposite of that, right? That it's it's kind of queer washes history, I guess, by excluding um, the AIDS crisis and vice versa. You know, the Brokeback Mansion is another example for some people, radical and queer, for others, mainstream. So I don't know how you resolve it necessarily. I, I do wonder, is it a kind of inevitable function of the increasing gains in visibility for these communities that, you know, and like if you look at something like RuPaul's Drag Race, right? Which takes, uh, which takes a uh, drag culture, which you know was the definition, I guess, of a kind of radical outsider culture, and makes it so commercial, you know. And and I I think I'm with, and you bring this up. I think I'm with Ben Schaff and Griffith on this that they are one in the same. I mean, I would like to think honestly that they're. I mean, I do understand the distinction, of course, right? I mean, of course, I get it. I get the distinction. But I'm just wondering, have we evolved enough that maybe we don't need that distinction any longer is kind of where I tend to land. But I have noticed that it uh, it depends very much, like you said, on who you're talking to. And there's certain scholars that you do not mix those two. They are very different. They serve two very different functions and they are definitely not one in the same. So, yeah. <laughs> very different functions and very different audiences mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean the critic who I love the most on this and I couldn't believe it when I found um his work on queer is is he Patrick Johnson of course and he writes about Moonlight so beautifully and defines it as queer um and queer I guess I'll just explain a little bit is um well I love the term because we always said queer in Ireland <laughs> not to mean uh queer or gay but just to mean strange actually but he, he talks about how his granny used to use it as well. Um, and so he uses queer as a kind of third term that escapes this kind of binary between LGBT themed and queer, and that actually acknowledges not only um, sexuality or not even only race and sexuality, but also um, class, uh, which I think is something that is often forgotten. And I love his work because he, he takes it back to the body and he does describe how queer theory can sometimes feel quite disconnected from lived bodily experience, which was something I really found odd or difficult to reconcile when I began the book because I was reading queer theory and I was reading critical race theory, both of which I really like. And one of the reasons I did the book was because I just wanted to know more. I did a postdoc uh, in Cornell and I hadn't really encountered these theories before, believe it or not. So it's just so fascinating, but they're so different in their approaches. You know, queer theory felt quite um, kind of uh, flu the fluidity of identity, whereas critical race theory is really grounded in, in the body in many instances. And I really like both approaches. And I think E. Patrick Johnson's work really brings them together in quite a beautiful way. And he would argue, and I obviously agree, that Moonlight does that uh, as well and um, kind of brings these, these net kind of uh, three identities together, really, in a way that can't be separated, I think. 
Yeah, no, I completely agree. When I speak of moonlight, I for sure call it a queer film. But but you know what? I also called Fair Brokeback Mountain a queer film. So you know, <laughs> I know, but I know um there's a <laughs> there's a colleague of mine who you know ardently argues that Brokeback Mountain is queer, but Moonlight is not so uh-huh. much. Yeah, so it's really it's really tricky to say, and it did come back a lot to this question of sex in the film. I don't know what yeah your thoughts on that. Sure. I think I think. It was in the question of kind of intimacy versus sex is the really tricky one to this. And I mean, I have to say, my students love that there's no sex. <laughs> They're like, oh, sex scenes in films are so cheesy. Um, like, I hate watching them. I'm really glad they didn't do that. Um, and it does, I mean, like, does intimacy so well. And E. Patrick Johnson, you know, talks about intimacy as the salve to the wound of poverty, which is such a beautiful phrase you know that actually the the kind of emotional wounds that we have are maybe best cured by the kind of intimacy they share at the end rather than just well just um a sex scene but then of course both together would be the hardest of all um you know intimacy and sex how to bring that together is maybe a problem that few people (laughs) saw in a really uh beautiful way but yeah i don't know what your thoughts are on that yeah, that was actually perfect because that was going to be my next question to you because a lot of people, uh, one of the criticisms of Moonlight, um, particularly with audiences, is that they wanted more of a clear at the end of the film, sort of, you know, sexual something, you know, <laughs> between uh, Kevin and and Black, and which did not happen. But you know, the funny thing is, personally. I felt the intimacy was so clear and palpable that I didn't feel like I needed it. But I thought it was so interesting how so many other people felt like they did. And I kind of wondered, is that because of the Hollywood ending? You know, is it because, or even I think like the Hallmark Channel, like everything always has to end with this kiss or this thing that shows that yes, we're going to be together. And because that wasn't there, and it's not familiar to them, and it's not the classic, you know, sort of like Hollywood ending, they they couldn't, it, it wasn't something that they felt like gave them closure. Yeah, I, I think it's really good to raise the fact that people did miss it. Um, I, Bordwell, David Bordwell uh, did a study, and he found that 90 out of 100 films <laughs> ended now in heterosexual kiss or mm-hmm. romance. But yeah, I think there's definitely a part of that. And I think that's part of Moonlight's status as kind of, you know, we, we didn't talk about this, but how it's situated, you know, recognized by Hollywood, obviously an, a, an example of African-American cinema, but also Jenkins is greatly influenced by European and Hong Kong art house cinema, which of course favors the open ending. And there's really clear references to Truffaut at the end, the 400 blows. That openness of the ending, I think we can see it in a kind of formal sense as well. It just feels like it would have been so hard to have that resolution in real life. Now, obviously, we don't want to kind of fall back on would that happen in reality, right? But, you know, Jenkins talks about how that admission at the end takes so much out of Chiron. Of course it does to admit you haven't been touched in so long. To admit that and then to see him being touched that's really powerful and I actually spotted that the pose they they hold at the end mimics an early image of Paula holding him it's it's almost the same pose and I thought there's a critic uh is it Rosanna Bradley who writes about how you know the the reconciliation with Paula allows Chiron to kind of take that leap uh, and go for that intimacy with Kevin and I think it's a really lovely, um, I think she calls it a resolution of the feminine in the film, that it kind of circles back to Paula again and allows him to have that connection between a parental intimacy and then a potential future intimacy. And just as a final point to mention, the actor Travante Rhodes talks about how he imagines Chiron and Kevin, 90 years old, holding hands, walking in Florida. And I just thought, oh, yeah. 
you know, we, we are allowed to do that. We are allowed to imagine. And at the end of the day, you know, I think we're probably going to talk about this. It is a film about love, but it's about much more than romantic love. Um, and I think, I think it's important that that romance is there at the end, but it's not. Ultimately, maybe it's, it's about him loving himself and the little child who we see at the end, you know? Yes. I was just going to bring that up. Like, to me, that when you talk a lot about this in the book, but, you, but I really love that image at the end where we go back to him as a child in the water, of course. And I, I want to talk about the metaphor of the water because I think that's so important as well. Um, but the water and then him looking back at the camera, to me, that is like the vision that will stick with me forever with that film because it, you're right, it's like it comes back full circle. And I just think that was genius. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's one of the most powerful things in the movie because we get that um, echo of the child. You know, section three begins with that dream, which is almost the same footage as we see of Paula shouting at him as a child. And so to come back to it like that, it just shows this kind of a recognition of well you know there's a, a lot of talk in the 90s about the inner child but it is that the, the fact that you know that child still exists and I think we all maybe have experiences where we we feel sad or upset about something hopefully not too often and then we can dig down and, and sometimes it is that that child within us that has something that's unresolved and McCraney talks about it you know he, I think he says uh, I, I'm still that vulnerable child and, and Jenkins mentions it as well, that that's what he was going to say in the speech. And I think it's a fantastic recognition because so often with coming of age films, they feel finished, don't they? They feel like, oh, they're going to go off into the world and everything's going to be fine. And that's not how it works, you know? <laughs> and, and maybe that's what he needed to do all along is to, well, he needed to do all along. He couldn't do it before now, but... You know, that integration of the child into the adult is part of his, you know, healing process. I don't know, you know, his transformation, the next stage of the transformation that we don't need to see. You know, we've been there for long enough. And it's kind of, I think, the film saying, you'll be OK, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, yes, that's definitely how I took it. So, yeah, that's why I felt like that was plenty enough closure for me. Look at <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it depends on what you want Moonlight to be. Do you want it to be a romantic film? Does queer cinema need to be about sex and romance in a kind of couple, or, you know, uh, that kind of uh, intimate relationship sense? Or can it also be about the individual, you know, exactly. primarily? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Which is another reason I put it in the queer film category. <laughs> No, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, all right. So before I get to the last thing, I just wanted to talk. The water metaphor I thought was so, and like, honestly, I hadn't seen that as before until I read the book. Like, obviously, I knew water played a really important part within the film. But I just think you just do such a great job of just showing how that metaphor is used throughout. Can you just kind of talk briefly about that? Yeah, I actually have to take out a whole section on water, so I'm hoping to do that as a separate, uh, a separate piece. Um, so water means so many things in the film. I mean, first of all, the water metaphors come from McCraney, the playwright Terrell Alvin McCraney, who who his works have been described as drowned. So he obviously grew up near the water, and he talks about how he identifies with this Yoruban goddess called Yamoja. Beyonce is also referenced her but she's a goddess who represents a kind of fluid sexuality and he even talks about how elders in his community growing up would say oh you're like Yamoja <laughs> and so his works and he's written about Hurricane Katrina and things so his works often evoke these kind of water metaphors obviously water is transformation but it's also threat I think we see that a lot in that beautiful swimming scene which captures I think so much of how experiences in childhood can be both exhilarating and frightening um, and the music feeds into that as well and that is water right it's exhilaration it's change but it can also be great devastation and destruction as well 
and of course that destructive aspect I guess comes in in the uh, scene in which Sharon and Kevin meet on the beach and he talks about turning into drops and so that kind of fluidity we get in the character of Sharon I think is kind of relates to the properties of water as something that's ever changing we know that the ocean is ever changing but at the same time when we look on it it it, it often looks the same right so there's that stability to his character as well as its evolution. Beyond that, there's so much um, kind of, I've mentioned the uh, African imagery, European imagery, but of course there's also Christian imagery. So Jared Sexton talks about, uh, talks a lot about this actually, his book is, is really, or his chapter is really good on the Christian metaphor. So Juan and Teresa as, you know, Christian names and how, Teresa is kind of figured uh, as a mother Teresa, almost kind of a savior figure. Um, and there's the political resonance of water. So I didn't know this, maybe you did, but uh, the Wadens that were instigated during the civil rights era in Florida. So groups of African Americans would wade into public swimming pools, oceans, and segregated beaches uh, as an act of political protest. So, you know, returning to the water in this sense is, is kind of a political gesture as well. And then finally, I suppose water is, along with Chiron's gaze and his eyes, it's one of the kind of uh, recurring images that Jenkins uses to connect the character across the three stages of the film. I mean, just one example would be Chiron boils the pot of water for his bath when he's a child. And then right at the end, we get Kevin, you know, boiling that pot again for a cup of tea. And of course, Sharon, what does he say? He says, oh, I just drink water, you know. So, yeah, it's connected to it throughout, really. It's, it's, it's a really important kind of metaphor. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. Like I said, I was fascinated by all of that. Like, I knew the water played an image, and I loved when he would put his face in the sink and like those kind of but I never saw how it all came together before your book. So yes, amazing job on that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right, well, before we go, I wanna just, this quote, cause we talked about, you just talked about moonlight is about love. And I loved your quote in the epilogue. You said, moonlight is about love, the love of parents and surrogate parents, willingly bestowed love, love twisted by addiction, tentative love, sensual love, squashed love, love that turns to violence, love lost, and love rediscovered. And I just thought, oh my God, that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Written uh, on a I very think... dark morning in January <laughs> at 5 a.m. <laughs> crying over my laptop when I'd about like two days to the deadline. <laughs> oh, but I think it just really like sums it up about all of these different things or, or, or different you know elements within the film that they that these people had to do well this person honestly had to deal with throughout and to to bring it all back to love I just think is inspiring thank you well I guess I felt I had to because the project I don't think I've done anything academic that I love so much to be honest I I can't believe I never got sick of the film I never stopped, you know, going back to look at scenes and watching them again and tearing up again. And I still am discovering things that I uh, I didn't even realize that I connected with in the film. And I think, as I said, I, I think maybe ultimately it's about learning to love yourself. You know, there's, there's a political kind of love and I do talk about that brilliant James Baldwin quote where he says, love is a battle, love is war, love is growing up, which is just, and he's talking about the relationship uh, of black Americans to America as a concept and also white Americans. But I think this can also be a personal concept as well. And it took me a while to think that my love is a battle, love is growing up, you know, and I, I think sometimes it's so easy to love someone else or think that we love someone else, but maybe the hardest is, love not only love yourself but maybe love aspects of yourself or love a past self and I think that child self you know going back to the ending can be quite difficult to love sometimes or a teenage self certainly in my case um, because they were 
they were so vulnerable and sometimes they were foolish but I think the vulnerability maybe is is the hardest part to acknowledge and I really like that writers like Balbuk for example you know she talked about love so much and so directly and you know Moonlight deals with love directly rather than framing it as vulnerability or care which are really important concepts as well I, I think we don't talk enough about love and what it means to just love a, a work of art and you know obviously the other levels of love within the film I think it takes me back to Paula again and you know my as I said my dad struggled with addiction and I, I wonder how much his love for us thankfully helped him to get through that and I think then I, I think about Paula you know and to what extent the love that she either got or wanted to give to Chiron that saved her, you know? Maybe Chiron couldn't love her because of what she'd done, but maybe her love for him was what pulled her through. And when we think about love in those terms, we do see how it is a battle and it is a struggle and it is growth rather than something static. And I think that's why the ending is so powerful as well, because it leaves that room, doesn't it, for, for growth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I just <laughs> I don't get it to talk about that aspect of the film very often because um people uh, it can make people not uncomfortable, but it is a hard thing to describe. But I think really that is ultimately what the film is about, and I think the love that Jenkins and McCraney felt for the character and for the filmmaking process just shines through in every frame. <laughs> Yes. Oh, I couldn't agree more with that. I like, and, and you know, I really do believe that it, you know, films, I, you know, and I say this to my students and they look at me crazy, but there is a sort of movie magic that happens when the right people come together with the right content and the right, that it just, and Moonlight to me is the perfect example of this. Like, I can't imagine it being in the hands, the script being, I mean, you know, uh, adapted so perfectly from McCraney's book and then put in the hands of Jenkins, who just did an amazing job of putting it together. I mean, that's movie mag magic at its best. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a perfect film to me. And, you know, there's great films and there's good films, but I think there's a few perfect films and I think they all have something of, a love in them or a passion for a topic um, or a character. And they also, I think, maybe have a little bit of this familiarity, you know, using fam the familiar and the strange and bringing them together as well to reach, you know, as many people as possible. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Oh, thank you so wonderful. much. Wonderful. Yeah, yes. <laughs> great chat. Thank you so much. Yes, I could talk about this forever, but but yes, but but I will tell everyone, please go get the book. It's definitely worth the read, and it's a quick read, which is nice too. So yeah, yeah, it was a great format um to work with. If anyone is thinking about it, uh, there's a few book series I definitely know of in the UK, and do feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Anyone listening, um, but I really enjoyed the format of just writing about one film now obviously you have to pick something that you really deeply um care about but it was really lovely to be able to just have that really in-depth uh focus oh, and you do an amazing job yes oh so. thanks so yeah. much <laughs> i really appreciate all that <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode featuring Maria Flood in conversation with Victor Evans. Dr. Flood's 2021 book, Moonlight, Screening Black Queer Youth, is available from Rutledge and through online booksellers. I'd like to thank Drs. Flood and Evans for their participation, as well as Ava Whiteley, this episode's producer. New Review of Film and Television Studies is published by Rutledge, Taylor & Francis. Emerson College is our institutional home. Please visit the New Review of Film and Television Studies blog at nrftsjournal.org and check out our YouTube channel for more podcast episodes featuring media studies scholars in conversation, including Carl Sweeney's interview with Stacey Abbott, author of a new BFI Film Classics volume on Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark. This is Maria Sanfilippo, editor of New Review of Film and Television Studies. Until next time, keep reading, watching, and listening. <laughs>